In this video, we're going to discuss 19th century anatomy textbooks predating Gray's. Gray's Anatomy, Descriptive and Surgical, probably the most famous anatomy book ever, or one of, was first published in 1858. Uh, here's a slightly later edition of it here. It went through different editorship. Um, we're going to devote an entire video to Gray's. I have multiple editions to talk about. There's much history to discuss. Gray's will get its own video. And so let's talk about anatomy before Gray's because there was a lot. <laughs> and this is just a small sampling of it. Um, obviously, the uh, 18th century anatomists bled into the early 19th century. And so Cheseldon and Monroe uh, still had, mu had uh, much influence over early anatomy. Um, I just sold my uh, most complete set of Monroe's anatomy, so we're going to leave that out for now because I really only have larger folio atlas type things to deal with there, and that's going to get a separate video as well. Uh, but just dealing with the textbooks, um, early... English anatomy actually was kind of getting a lot of spillover from the French schools. And so here we have Xavier Bichat's anatomy in four volumes. It was originally three with additions added in a fourth um, by another contributor. And uh, in addition to that, and, and Bichat's anatomy, um, he was a surgeon and so his surgery came to us through DeSalt and his anatomy is in keeping kind of with that, um, that state of medicine at the time where the surgeons were informing us. This was very much the case uh, throughout the 17th and 18th centuries and still into the 19th. Uh, so a lot of surgeons writing anatomy books. Uh, we have here also 1828 Samuel David Gross one of the most famous surgeons ever to live and certainly of the uh, 19th century and his first publication we can see the title here uh, is actually a translation uh, translated from the french uh, by bailey and hollard was were the original authors and so his first publication is a general anatomy book and it is a translation work from French. So French schools of anatomy uh, were holding sway. Uh, Bichat, certainly an immortal name, you know, through his surgery. Also his uh, pathology, um, his, experience, his uh, experiments into physiology and pathology also. So those were uh, very prominent names that would have been well known uh, to anybody studying medicine or surgery at the time. Now, it's worth mentioning that those are anatomy textbooks, but there were divisions occurring in anatomy books at that time that we don't see quite as much today. They do exist, and that's the difference between anatomy atlases, anatomy textbooks, and dissectors. There are still some dissectors around today. They're not really holding the sway they once did. Uh, in the early 19th century, there were several dissectors. One of them being among the most popular was the Dublin dissector. And so these uh, taught you how to do the cadaver dissection and what you should be looking at and what you should be exposing in the course of the dissection. It's not merely descriptive anatomy of the structure of the human body, but it has a method to it following the practice of dissection. There were others, uh, another early 19th century one, this is Green's. I've never seen another copy of this that I can recall, actually, interestingly enough. Uh, but they did go on into uh, the later half of the 19th century. Here is Erasmus Wilson's dissector. Now, Wilson we will come back to, so hold that name uh, in your mind there. Um, and I don't seem to have it in front. Oh, here we go. Here we go. So, in the American side of things, um, Worcester and Horner are names to know for pre-Gray's Anatomy. Um, oh, before we talk about them, we got to talk about Bell. I have Bell here somewhere. Um, oh yeah, Bell. So, the famous surgeons and anatomists from the French schools that were influencing anatomy, the England had its own counterparts, and 
um, in the 19th century. Bell's Anatomy. Um, I just sold my complete set of bells. I happen to have a stray volume three and four here left over, uh, bound as one. And so Bell's Anatomy is another one to look for. Uh, very influential in the early part of the 19th century and, and worth knowing. Um, so I'm sorry about that deviation. Let's get back to Wister and Horner. The first anatomy book published in America was Wister's, and it went through several rounds of editorship uh, after Wister, uh, including Horner. Uh, so this, is, this happens to be a seventh edition of Wister, and we can see uh, this is an earlier edition. I think this was a second of 1811. Let's see what I've got here. 1817, excuse me. It was first published in 1811. Uh, so this is an 1817 edition. And then you can see here on this set, it reads Pankos Wister. And Pankos was a very famous surgeon of the day. And so Again, the surgical involvement in teaching general surgical and special anatomy was huge. And so Horner was one of the editors of Worcester, and Horner published several anatomy books as well. A practical anatomy, which was basically a dissector. And then he also published a special anatomy, uh, which is... Oh, I do have one of his other general anatomies. <laughs> and a special anatomy here. Uh, he has a general anatomy, a practical anatomy, a special anatomy, later special anatomy with histology, and then also a pathological anatomy. And Horner's pathological anatomy of 1829 was the first in the United States. And so I will do a separate video on pathological anatomy as well. Um, something to look for, though, is an evolution in the layout of these books. And that brings us to Paxton's Anatomy, uh, this one edited by Lewis. What was common in the layout of these is if they had plates, they were folding plates gathered at the rear of the book, usually. Sometimes they were intermixed, but not usually. Um, and so you would do a lot of flipping. Paxton's Anatomy put it into an organization that maybe feels a little more familiar to us if you know grays, and that is figures that were incorporated into the text. So you weren't flipping. There's the text you were reading and the images you needed to see. And so Paxton did that and kind of changed the face of the anatomy book for us. Um, about this same time, anatomy really caught on in the mind. And there were a lot of um, anatomy books written for the laity. Home medicine and stuff was big, even home surgery and home anatomy. And so this is a copy of The House I Live In, and this one is 1846, 12th edition. And so it was very common, very popular, went through numerous editions, and there were other books like it, which were anatomy basically for families to learn. And it's, it's interesting how robust that publication was. Um, we mentioned Erasmus Wilson before. This is Wilson's Anatomy here, which again, this is a later edition under new editorship. If you didn't know all those other things that I just told you, and you had only ever heard of and handled grays, and then you found out about Wilson's and picked it up, it would feel very, very familiar to you. It feels like grays in a lot of ways and has a number of plates that uh, are in very much a similar style to what you would see in gray. So, oops, I said plates, but they're figures, I apologize. Um, so this, this is very much in keeping with the context that grays arose from. Grays was very thorough, comprehensive, well executed, but there were a lot of great anatomy books that preceded it that were not significantly its inferior, and they continued in print after Gray's was published. It did have competition. It did not immediately win the day and eradicate all history of anatomy prior to it. So we'll do a separate video about Gray's, but you've been introduced now to textbooks and dissectors uh, from the early 19th century uh, in anatomy, and we will have to do a separate video on atlases because there are impressive 19th century anatomy atlases, which I have many uh, around me here that you can't see yet. Some of them absolutely enormous and breathtaking. 